Okay, um, so we've been doing a series around here. We, we're going through the book of uh, John, the Gospel of John, and uh, we're looking at how there are seven signs that John includes uh, that point to the divinity of Jesus um, God the, as God the Son. So as part of that, we have a memory verse. And so uh, John 20, 31, anybody got it? That's a negatory ghost writer. Okay, so John 20, 31, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is, oh, there's the cheat sheet right there, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that by believing you may have life in his name. And that is also the verse of purpose for the entire Gospel of John. So we are given these things so that we may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Anointed One, the Messiah, also the Son of God, God the Son, and that by believing those things internally and also to the point of submission to those truths that we may have life in His name. So... Okay, so let's get to it today. A little bit of review. Um, gosh, but first, um, uh, I don't know. Anybody watch the news? Uh, now it's the banks. Woo! It's like every day there's something new. But what a time to be alive. You know what I'm saying? Like it, we are living in the time, like God in his infinite wisdom in, in all the, of time and humanity has, has decided that you and I were to be alive in this moment, yes. in this time, in this season. And so will you be faithful to the end? Will you have faith and choose faith over fear? So, uh, but change is in the air, and I hope that you're ready. Are you ready? Yes. Oh. Are you are you ready? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> kind of, yeah. Let me ask you this. Are you willing to allow the Lord to lead you into holy discomfort? Yeah. So good. Because we're going there anyway. So ready or not. Okay? All right, so we've been looking at, like I said, this series, and the first one was the sign of the party. It was the wedding at, the, at Cana, and uh, it was talking about the marriage supper of the Lamb, and, and then we talked about last week how uh, Jesus is, is Lord over the limits that we like to impose. You know, he's, he's a God who jumps out of the box that we try and stick him in. Uh, he's, he's God here, and he's God there. He is God everywhere we need him to be, and there's no distance with him. Um, so today we're going to look at uh, something else, the third sign. Um, so let me clarify a couple of things and, and a little bit of theology up front and, and why it matters. Okay, Jesus is God the Son. There is none beside him. There are no gods beside him. There is no, uh, there's nothing in competition with him. Jesus is God the Son. Mary was blessed among all women, but is not the queen of heaven or divine in any way. If you pray to her, she can't hear you. Sorry. She was 100% human, and that's it. She was used by God, blessed among women, to be honored for sure, but she was not divine in any way. Buddha's ashes are in China. Muhammad's body is in Medina. But Jesus is alive. Yes. Only one conquered the grave and is alive forevermore. And you are not a Christian. You're not a follower of Jesus if this is not your confession. And this is why Mormons, for example, are not Christian even though they have Jesus in their name, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Jesus is not a created being, or, uh, nor is he the brother of Lucifer. This is why the Jehovah's Witnesses, the J-dubs as I call them, are not Christian because Jesus is not a created being and is not the Archangel Michael. By the way, this isn't just some theological fight between Bible nerds. Uh, it, it matters. It, it matters more than anything else 
who we say that Jesus is. And that's why we look at who he said he was, because our faith is placed in him for our salvation. This is the central tenet of the Christian faith across all denominations of our faith. Jesus is God the Son. Jesus has always been, he has always existed, and he will always be. He did not start at a certain point. He did not start when, at Christmas when he was born into this world. It, it, it's why the, the, the miracle of the incarnation that we celebrate at Christmas is so overwhelming. It, it's why his blood has the power and the potency to save all of humanity. If he was not God, then he was just a good man who died a tragic death, and whose death had no power to save. So today's passage, and really the entire chapter of John chapter 5, which we're not going to get to, uh, is driving home this very point. It, it matters. It's not just being, you know, why are you being so intolerant over other beliefs? Because they're wrong. And that's not me saying it. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Him. Let that be your confession. Let that be your faith. So today we look at the third of John's signs. So would you stand with me in honor of God's Word? John chapter 5, we're going to be through one, verses 1 through 18. Look at you all groaning when the pastor makes you stand up. Come on. We're supposed to spring into this, right? Spring into this, you know. You're all just like, that's a fresh. I just just getting comfortable. And you just make me stand up all during worship, and then I get comfortable, and then you know. Gonna... We should get our jump on. Huh? Okay. Woo! 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 Okay, we're good. All right, John chapter 5. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what's happening. All right, uh, John chapter 5, starting at verse 1. This is a good place to start. Um, afterward, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holy days. Uh, inside the city, near the Sheep Gate, was the pool of Bethesda with five covered porches. Crowds of six people, blind, lame, or paralyzed, lay on the porches. One of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. When Jesus saw him and knew he had been ill for a long time, he asked him, Would you like to get well? Verse 7, I can't, sir, the sick man said, for I have no one to put me in the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone else always gets there ahead of me. Jesus told him, Stand up, pick up your mat, And walk. Instantly. How long did it take? Instantly. The man was healed. He rolled up his sleeping mat, his mat, and began walking. But this miracle happened on the Sabbath. So the Jewish leaders were upset. Um, They said to the man who was cured, You can't work on the Sabbath. The law doesn't allow you to carry the sleeping mat. But he replied, the man who healed me told me, pick up your mat and walk. Who said such a thing as that? They demanded. The man didn't know, for Jesus had disappeared into the crowd. But afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and told him, now you are well, so stop sinning or something even worse may happen to you. Then the man went and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had healed him. So the Jewish leaders began harassing, literally persecuting, Jesus for breaking the Sabbath rules. But Jesus replied, My father is always working, and so am I. So the Jewish leaders tried all the harder to find a way to kill him, for he not only broke the Sabbath, he called God his Father, thereby making himself equal with God. Let's pray. Father, we just welcome you to come in this place. We, we want to 
experience you, the love of the Father through the Spirit. Jesus, we want, we want you in every way possible. God, this world's getting darker every day, but you are the light of the world. Would you please come into this place? Lord, these people have come. They've gathered. They're here to worship. They're here to receive your word. God, we're not here to just do routine. We're not here to check a box. We're here to meet with you. Would you please come? Fill this room. Fill our hearts. Speak to us, challenge us, change us, make us more like Jesus in every way. Would you please come? We welcome you. And Lord, please be with those that are dealing with sickness this morning, uh, dealing with COVID and coughs and all this stuff. God, we just pray for healing in the name of Jesus. Ask it in your name. Amen. You may be seated. So we have our passage today, but I kind of want to work backwards through our passage. I want to I start with the last part and then back it up. So we're going to be starting with uh, the latter part of verse 9, where it says, But this miracle happened on the Sabbath. So the Jewish leaders objected. They said to the man who, who was cured, You can't walk on the Sabbath. The law doesn't allow you to carry that. So he replied, The man who healed me said I could, and I'm going to listen to him. Uh, so who said, such a th- who said such a thing as that? Um, they demanded, like, it's just ridiculous, isn't it? Like, I mean, it's just, what? But the man didn't know, for Jesus had disappeared into the crowd. So a man is miraculously healed from something that kept him lame for 38 years And the only thing that the religious crowd, the church folks, could see is that it was done on the Sabbath. Not celebrate that God has miraculously healed a man that was lame for 38 years. It's just, it's so backwards. You know, Jesus, even over in Mark chapter 2, explained that the Sabbath wasn't made for man, but man for the Sabbath. Or did I get that backwards? Sabbath was made to meet the needs of people, not people weren't made to meet the needs of the Sabbath. It it was something to provide us rest, not to be enslaved to. But why is John including this event in his gospel that is aimed at proving that Jesus is God? Because he healed many people. There's many accounts of ministry. Why would this be a sign particularly? What is it about this whole exchange that he wanted us to see? Verse 15, then the man went and told the Jewish leaders it was Jesus who healed him. So the Jewish leaders began persecuting Jesus for breaking the Sabbath rules. But Jesus replied, my father is always working, so am I. So the Jewish leaders tried all the harder to find a way to kill him. They wanted to murder him because of doing good works and healing people. For he not only broke the Sabbath, he called God his Father, thereby making himself equal with God. So the rabbis, the Pharisees, the scribes, the leaders understood exactly what Jesus' words meant. They understood, they connected the dots that Jesus was saying that he was equal to God. So we, don't, we often don't understand sometimes when we read our Bibles because we're not first century Jews. Um, but Jesus made this claim all throughout in, in different points. His favorite title for himself was Son of Man, which is a, which is a prophetic description of, of Christ and from Daniel. Um, and so, but he also said, John 10, 30, I'm the, I and the Father are one. Uh, John 12, 45, he who sees me sees the one who sent me. John 14, 9 and 10, he who has seen me has seen the Father. You want to get to know God the Father, study the life of Jesus. In the rest of the chapter in John chapter 5, 
Uh, John recounts Jesus' words, and then he unpacks it some more. He goes through it. He explains some things. Jesus goes on to clarify and and talk about what he's saying when he says that. Uh, We're not going to get all to that, um, but let's let's go ahead and back up to the beginning of our passage now. Um, You see, when we're talking about this man, and um, this man that Jesus identified and then healed, it would seem at first that this man in our passage is almost incidental in the story. I don't know, we, we read through this, we don't know his name, don't know his story. You know, he was just sitting there doing his thing that he's done for 38 years. And so, um, it would seem that he's incidental because Jesus heals him and then disappears. It's like he weaves through the crowd, it's like, hey, you want to be well? Yeah, but I can't. Sure you can. Pick up your mat. Walk. Okay. And Jesus is like, bloop, bloop, and you know, he disappears in the crowd. And then this man's walking, carrying his mat. He's probably having a great time. And then he gets called out by the Pharisees. So, uh, but he, you know, Jesus does this miracle on the Sabbath on purpose, knowing it would get the religious, legalistic crowd all riled up. Jesus is instigating. I love my Jesus. He just riles people up. He'd be like, hey, watch this. I'm going to go out heal this dude. Watch what the Pharisees do. Like, hey, you want to be well? I can't. Sure you can. Get healed. Go, wake up. Go, go. Do it. He's like, boom. And probably watching like, like look, look how mad they are right now. This is amazing. Like, they totally don't get it at all. He's an instigator. Oh, man, I just, the cultural Jesus that's out there, I just honestly can't stand it because it doesn't reflect the biblical Jesus. The instigator in chief, the, 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 the ministry of, of, of confrontation that happens so many times. You know, there's all kinds of things going on in Jerusalem during this time. It's one of the feast holidays. We don't know which one, maybe Passover. Um, and so, like, all these things are going on in God's name, but nobody's getting it. All this religious activity is going on, much like our Sundays, but nobody's getting it. What do I have to do to get these people's attention and focus on me? And I hope to God that He's not looking at us saying, why won't they get it? They just focus on me. So he's instigating. He's stirring things up. But the man, he wasn't incidental. He wasn't just a piece in the story that didn't really matter. Verse 14, we see that afterward Jesus found him. He went and found him in the temple. And he said, now you're well. And then in kind of a sobering point, he says, so stop sinning or something even worse may happen to you. We don't know his backstory. I, we know that from the rest of Scripture, it's certainly not saying that, that anytime somebody suffers with sickness or uh, uh, some kind of disability, uh, it's not from sin, you know, there's, there's, I've heard different things said, and it just, ugh. but we do know in this case, there seems to be some kind of correlation, and so Jesus gives this prophetic warning to this man, because he knows our story, right? Do, would you all agree that there are repercussions to our actions? And that sometimes it can cause us to be disabled in some way if we're doing something stupid, right? If I walk off the top of this building on the, on the roof and I'm like, it won't hurt me. It's going to hurt me. And I, <laughs> it may disable me in some way. 
So there are consequences to our actions, which apparently, in this case, there's something. But the important thing is, Jesus forgave, saw past that, extended healing, became a part of God's agenda and God's story in this moment, and then comes and gives a word of warning. So Jesus knows his story. If you think about it, that's an amazing thing. Because he knows your story. Not the face that we like to show everybody else. He knows the real story. He knows our motivations. He knows what drives us. He knows what we've done. And the fact that he still loves us anyway is stunning. So Jesus sought him out yet again after the healing. This man already had his healing, but he sought him out to give him a word of of restoration. He didn't know, this man didn't know Jesus. He he didn't know his name. He couldn't answer the, the Pharisees' question. There's no mention of this man's faith. There's no mention of this man's repentance. He's just a man in need, and Jesus sought him out twice. And so this man, he's, he's healed at the pool of Bethesda. And so we know his name. We don't know very much about him at all. But why was he at this pool? Well, uh, I'm going to play a video here in just a second because this is one of the places we will visit on our Israel trip in January. Um, there's a sign-up sheet out there for you to, to sign up. Again, we need to take uh, somewhere between 20 and 40 people. Um, costs and all that, there's going to be a deposit that's due in June, but I encourage you, if at all possible, to prayerfully consider going with us, because it will open your eyes to a lot of different things, but uh, while I was in Israel, I was thinking of y'all, and so I knew I was going to be doing this series, so uh, I did a, a little video from the Pool of Bethesda that we'll go ahead and show now. So I'm standing on the northern tip of the old city of Israel. Uh, The Temple Mount is very close. Um, And behind me, you see where the pool of Bethesda was located. Uh, The Bet Hesta is um, the house of mercy. And this is the place in John chapter 5 where they used to believe that um, the angel would come and stir the waters. Uh, First one in, uh, you know, gets the healing. Everybody else is rotten egg. Um, anyway, um, but uh, which actually is a pagan uh, belief and based on the Greek god Asclepius, um, which you see uh, doctors, nurses, medicine, the, the staff with the, 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 uh, the snakes twirled around it. Um, that all started right here. Um, but Jesus came and saw the paralyzed man who had been here for decades and said, do you want to be healed. It's one of uh, the few miracles done by Jesus in uh, Jerusalem, uh, in so a special place where a man found healing and mercy. And what an interesting question of somebody that's here and has been here for decades trying to be healed. And Jesus asked him, do you want to be healed? It's an interesting question, isn't it? Anyway, you see some Roman um, ruins on top of where the pool uh, actually would have been. There would have been two pools, an upper and a lower, um, fed by uh, an aqueduct, a dike, and uh, when the top one would fill, it would overflow to fill the lower one. Um, So, yeah, one of the signs um, that John was trying to communicate, uh, Jesus was showing his authority. Um, John was making a point that Jesus was showing that his authority was equal uh, and the same as God himself, uh, thereby again uh, uh, showing that uh, John is trying to say Jesus is God the Son. So yeah, right here is where the pools of Bethesda stood. And I'll go ahead and get my face out of the way. Deep, as you can see, it's, it's very deep over there. And 
Pretty cool, huh? Um, yeah, kind of. So I, I'm growing this out. I'm doing a favor for my college pastor, if you're wondering what this is all about here. Just reminded me watching that. But uh, um, uh, So anyway, uh, so that's one of the places where we'll visit. And uh, so learning that that was uh, the, kind of the origin of this uh, uh, Greek god Asclepius. We have a picture um, that we'll put up, uh, and you see the staff with the uh, the serpent around it. And go ahead to the next one. Just shows the staff, and and maybe you've seen this before. Um, it's a, it's a it's a modern day medical symbol. Go ahead and show the next one. That's a, an EMS logo. Uh, maybe that looks familiar. Um, so this mythology has been around for a long, long time. Um, and uh, so I, I, I want to look at our passage again real quick. Could you put up the first uh, few verses um, that we had up there? Uh, let's see. Go ahead to the next, uh, co- next uh, verse 2. Okay, with five covered porches. Go ahead to the next one. Okay, crowds of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, lay on the porches. Go ahead to the next one. Anybody notice anything? Where's verse 4? Back that up one. Yeah. You notice? It goes from 3, go ahead to the next one, to 5. What's that about? Somebody, there's a conspiracy. Somebody snipped a verse out of my Bible. Um, go ahead and go down to where the, the part that I've included that's part of the variant text um, that has three, um, uh, latter part of three and then verse four. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Um, so um, the latter part of verse three and, uh, and verse four are what's known as a variant text. I'm um, going to give you a little Bible study here, okay? Uh, I've seen a lot of videos lately where there's conspiracy theorists. This is where I take my tinfoil hat off, um, although I'm firmly in that club now. Um, but uh, this is not a conspiracy. This is not altering God's word for some kind of uh, nefarious agenda. Um, we have these things in Scripture called variant texts, and so the latter part of verse 3 and verse 4, um, the majority, uh, the earliest, most reliable manuscripts that we have do not include these words. These words were most likely added later by a scribe trying to be helpful, explaining what was going on, trying to give some context to why this man was waiting and, and the waters, and so on. Um, but the, the majority of the later manuscripts add these following words, waiting for the moving of the water for an angel of the Lord from time to time, went down in the pool, stirred up the water, so the one who went in first after the stirring of the water was healed of whatever disease he suffered. Um, so first, first one in gets the healing, the rest of you, rotten eggs. Um, according to local tradition, the first one in the water would be healed. But the Bible nowhere teaches this kind of superstition. This, uh, this is a situation that would have been a cruel contest for many ill people. Um, this man had no chance, even if he had people to help him. You know, later scribes, they're trying to be helpful. Why is this, what's going on with this text, trying to describe what's happening? And so they included this local belief based on the Greek god Asclepius. But uh, so later scribes added these words and they were trying to give context, like I said. But it's, listen, it's the same, you can read that and you can 
if you, if you know your scripture, if you're reading the Bible, you would see like, wow, this just really doesn't seem to fit with the God that I know. And so you have this superstition that has, has creeped into people's belief systems. It's the very same kind of superstition that people engage in today in various ways. Along with Friday the 13th, black cats, broken mirrors, knocking on wood, and Groundhog Day, we also have things like making the sign of the cross on your chest a certain number of times for good luck. We also have the superstition Bury a statue of St. Joseph upside down facing the house as an outward symbol of one's faith and prayer uh, while trying to sell your house. Don't do that. Ask the Lord. Another superstition, doing good works somehow erases bad works you've done. Another superstition, Believing that the month that you were born in and your astrological sign somehow determine the kind of day you're going to have and you're going to meet your true love on Thursday. Ooh, it's going to be a good week. I'm a Virgo, you know. But these are all absurd superstitions that people believe today. What I want you to do is I want you to see Jesus. I want you to know that he's enough. I want you to know that we can be done with all the silliness, the, all the religious garbage. Jesus is enough. Like, Jesus, I need to sell my house. Everything I have is yours. Uh, would you please be with me and give me favor in this? That's enough. <laughs> I'll tell you what's real. It's Jesus. He, and he still heals people, and he still sets people free today. I've seen it. And if you weren't here last week, this is my look I'm giving you. <laughs> if you weren't here last week, Ashlyn came up and shared her testimony. And like, I don't know if y'all got it or not, because like, it's like super dope. Like, I don't know if you understand the fact that we have verifiable proof of a divine miracle where she had a fracture in her jaw that showed up on an x-ray, and then she went back, and all evidence of ever having, an X or ever having a fracture was gone. Normally, if it heals, you have calcium deposits that show where the healing happened and it mended and it's stronger than before, and you, maybe you know all that. This x-ray showed that nothing had ever happened. It's a, it's a creative miracle that is something so astounding that it defies medical knowledge. My Jesus did that. God still heals today. Do you know that? Do you believe it? Well, he, maybe for other people. Verse 5. One of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. What would that do to a person? To lay there for 38 years with hope deferred, which we know in Scripture makes the heart sick. This man have, had to have had some kind of battle with depression. Maybe today. I don't know. But verse 6, when Jesus saw him and knew he had been ill for a long time, he asked him, would you like to get well? Do you want to be well? Like I said in the video, isn't that an odd question to ask this man? I mean, Jesus, we know he knows his backstory. Wouldn't it be an odd thing to walk up to someone who is sitting by the pool hoping to get healed for 38 years, and the question you ask him is, 
do you want to be well? I'd be like, why do you think I'm here? At least that's how I think maybe I would respond, but I don't know. I, life is odd, isn't it? Like the seasons we go through and the things that happen in our lives. Um, you know, for 38 years, at minimum, this was likely half his life. But, so why ask him this? You know, just like the silly superstitions that people believe, people believe lies about themselves all the time. Well, maybe God wants me this way. Maybe God is mad at me and I, he just wants me to stay sick. 38 years, maybe he got used to it. He, oh, he's still there, but like he just, maybe he built a life around his sickness and disability. Because we do that, don't we? Oh, do you want to be well? Well, I've got Beggar's Poker Club on Thursdays. Um, can you maybe come back and, after that? Because I've built a life here, you see, and I'm, I'm afraid to hope on healing. I'm afraid to, this is, this is my life now. This is where I'm at. This is where I've had to adjust to. Have you been in those kind of seasons where you've gone through something harsh, you've gone through something you've had to deal with, and then you're like, well, maybe this is just who I am. You see, Jesus, I, you know, you asked me if I want to get well, but, but this is my spot, and if I move, and, and, you know, maybe this thing comes back, and then I'll lose my spot. Uh, you know, this spot gets good shade in the hot spot, spot hot parts of the day, and, you know, Lenny tried to take my spot last week, but I made him get out. Can you fill in your own narratives of, of what would happen if Jesus asked you this question, but you've been there so long? This is my identity now. Think about how we, as a people, have adapted over the last three years. You know, the human ability to adapt to the worst things is amazing, isn't it? Like, you can find people in the worst situations. In the Philippines, I hope to be able to take you all there on a trip sometime soon, but one of the places we'll go to is called Payatas. It's a garbage dump for Manila. Mount, literally mountains of garbage, and it stinks. But you'll find people living there, and they have open sores on their bodies because of the infections and the disease, and, and yet they build houses there, and the children will come up and hug you and it'll rip your heart out because you want to say, don't you know that you're sick? The human ability to adapt, honestly, it's an amazing thing. Sometimes it's a blessing. Sometimes it can see us through some difficult seasons that we have to go through. That, that's a good thing. Uh, but, you know, that we adapt instead of completely shutting down, that's a good thing. But sometimes we adapt to something and call it home when it's only meant to be something you're traveling through. Three years ago was 2020, and about this time was a lockdown party. I had something come on my Facebook memory thing. I'm like, oh, my gosh. Like, you know, remember the toilet paper thing? <laughs> right? That was just the beginning. That was nothing. But I remember I posted because, like, you know, I, I get these big Sam's Club toilet paper packs. Anybody know what I'm saying about? Like, that's good stuff. Takes care of business. And so I had several of those big things in our basement. Just, I wasn't hoarding. That's just how I lived, like. Like, oh, there's another one. Every time I go to Sam's, I better get another one of those. So we had tons in our basement, and I was posting online like, what's up now, people? My wife used to hate that I have these down here. Now she's like, I'm a hero. <laughs> like, anybody need some paper? I got a kid going to college, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <You know? laughs> but we, we adapt, and, and like we look back at that time, and we adapted, didn't we? And 
and, and, but that was only the beginning of this crazy story. And we've adapted. If, if you could go back and tell the you of five years ago about all the things that we have adapted to in the last several years, that you wouldn't believe it. I'd never let them force me to stay in my home. I'd never let them force me to wear a mask. This is America. Never happened. I'd never surrender to getting some shot from Big Pharma. Blah, 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 blah. I'd never, I'd never, I'd never. And here we are. Isn't it amazing? Yeah, we stayed. We all stayed talking to our five-year-ago five self. Yeah, we all stayed in our home for a couple months because of some CDC guy. We won't, we won't talk about him, but uh, yeah, we, we, we all wore masks around for like a year because we were told by the government that it was helping our neighbor. Yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah. Oh, get this. Yeah, the nightly news is now telling us that there are UFOs running around and there's some mothership in our solar system, but it's all good. We're fine. It's fine. Everything's fine. Would the you of five years ago believe the nonsense that we have put up with? You ever think about that? Yeah, yeah. You know, and here's, here's, here's the good one, too. Uh, not only do we have these, you know, spy balloons and whatever, but, it, you know, everybody that has them has their hand hovering over the big red nuke em button and is ready to smash that thing. But it's fine. We're all good. It's fine. We're good. Isn't it absurd, the things that we will adapt to, because we, we so desperately want a normal. We want to find a normal. We just are trying to live our lives, and yet all of this. Now, like I said, overall, it's a good thing that we don't panic and shut down at these things, that we're not paralyzed but at the same time, I find it disturbing that we're all acting like it's normal. For example, you know, we're, we're told, uh, the things that we're told to watch for uh, at the return of Jesus are all happening everywhere. And, and contrary to Paul's command to not forsake the assembling together of ourselves, especially as we see the day of the Lord approaching, we're like, meh. It's just, meh. It's fine. It's amazing what we adapt to. It's amazing when we find ourselves living with something that we know is contrary to God's will, which is, is the best for us, and we simply are like, Meh. It's a terrible thing when people are abused sexually or verbally or both. What's even worse is, is when they begin to think that they deserve it. It's my normal. Oh, I've been here before. I can, I can handle this. People internalize false facts that they're just that kind of person that should be abused, and they go back for more all the time. Do you want to be well? You see, I don't find that question as confusing as I once did. I think that there's intention in the question that Jesus asks us. Do you want to be well, or do you want to stay in whatever this is that you've crafted for yourself? Do you want to be well? People who are sick, people who are disabled in some way, uh, just, you know, adopt uh, an identity and form a supportive culture around it. And he comes and he says, do you want to be well? I've made a life here. I, uh, I don't know. We have churches that have ceased to be Jesus and Bible focused and are instead communities formed to affirm 
and celebrate things that are absolutely contrary to God's will for them. They adopt an identity formed in brokenness. They find others like them, and they build a God who approves, and then they form a whole life on that. Do you want to be well? Sometimes the answer is no. But sometimes the answer is yes, but I need help. Yes, I want to be well, but I need help. I can't do this on my own. As the man in our passage says, I, yes, I want to be well, but I can't make it to the waters in time. I don't have anybody to help me. Yes, I want to be well, but I don't know how. Yes, I want to be well, but I'm stuck. Stuck. Yes, I want to be well, but I've been told that the answer is something that I don't think I can do. I can't, sir. Verse 7, the sick man said, for I have no one to put me in the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone else always gets there ahead of me. Someone always beats me to it. I can't get there. I know where the healing's at. I just need help to get there. I just can't get there on my own strength. I'd like you to meet the Jesus who seeks out the forgotten. I, I, he seeks out the hopeless, the lied to, the abused, the weak, the overlooked. That's the Jesus that I, that I want you to see, that he offers you a lifeline of healing. Isaiah 35, 6 says this, the lame like this man will leap like a deer and those who cannot speak will sing for joy. Springs will gush forth in the wilderness and streams will water the wasteland, which is happening right now, by the way, in, in the deserts across this world. Water is flowing. It's a crazy miracle. But Jesus comes and he offers hope. He offers healing power, deliverance, and then there's joy on the other side of that rather than the thing that you've just had to accommodate for so long. See, there's something going on in the world. Jesus is getting ready to call his bride to himself. He's doing amazing things. He's bringing life to dead hearts. He's healing people seemingly at random. He is near. He's reviving dead things. He's awakening the sleeping, distracted, dead-eyed people. He's near. Do you want to be well? Or do you want to stay where you're at? I wish the answer to that question more was yes, I want to be well. I don't know how long you've been with your particular need. Is it 38 years like the man in this passage? Maybe it's longer than that. I don't know. Have you adapted and grown accustomed to your condition? Or do you want to be well? You can say no. You have this gift of free will. You can say no. You can stay as you are. You can continue in the patterns that you've been walking in year after year after year, thinking that this time it's going to be different. No, it isn't. It's the same. You can cling to the life that you've built around your brokenness, but, but the help that you have longed for is here now. Jesus is near. The command is given, pick up your mat and walk. Pick up the, and carry the thing that once carried you. Let strength enter into you and enable you to do what you were unable to do before. Who says this? Jesus Christ, our Messiah. God the Son says so. And He has the authority to speak and the power to do. Why don't you stand with me?
We're going to close today much like how we have been closing, where it's just going to be open-ended. Um, we're going to continue in worship, um, and the altars are open. Um, you want to come forward, spend some time with Jesus, just personally, you and Him, do it. Just worship. Just talk to Him. Do it. Take advantage of this time. If you want to come forward for prayer, we'll be here. Uh, but do it. We're just going to continue open-ended. Please don't leave today before you go in and check out the missions convention and the fellowship hall, though. Uh, but that's how we're going to end it today. Uh, we're just going to close in worship. And so I just really encourage you. The extended hand of Jesus is here. Take it. Come forward. There's something about coming to the altar instead of staying in your chair. It's just something that happens. It's a release of some kind. I don't know. I don't fully understand it. But I'm going to encourage you to step into it and not just stay where it's comfortable. Get uncomfortable and step into something. So that's how we're going to do it. God bless you.